Welcome to the Grand Zero podcast. Thank you for your time. No, thanks for having me. Um, let me just get rid of that alert off my screen. There we go. Are you love an alert. See you. Red alert. <laughs> no, genuinely, thanks for giving me your time. Um, takes a lot of balls to come on a podcast. Yeah, well, it's actually the first one I've done. So it's, uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, virgin. Yeah, podcast virgin. Uh, <laughs> listen, listen to lots, never been on one. It's. Um, do you know what? Be good, good crap. I, I, I used to love listening to him before I started doing him. I used to love <laughs> listening to like obviously the benchmark Joe Rogan and a few others. But yeah, yeah. when when before I even press record, I was like, oh, there's no way I could sit and have a conversation with with someone on record because the amount of time, <laughs> the amount of times people like they they at the beginning step phase they they freeze up a little bit. Yeah, because they're aware that it's on record. Um, and usually, when the conversation starts flowing, that's that's kind of get used happen. to it. Especially over the last couple of years, with uh, everything going remote and moving to Teams and and Zoom and stuff like that, so it's kind of become the norm. I think two years ago, if you'd have asked me to jump yeah. on and do a recorded conversation, I'd have <laughs> shot me pants and said, "No, it's all right." <laughs> Fuck off! <laughs> Fuck off! So let, let's um get a little bit of background about you. Um, obviously, people are going to be like, "Uda." Who's this guy that's come on? Yeah, yeah. Who's this? So, so ex, uh, ex, ex police. Yeah, yeah. So ex police did. Um, so just short of ten years um, with West Yorkshire Police. Left back in two thousand and fourteen. Um, great career. Absolutely loved loved it. It's something I wanted to do since I was eight years old. Um, yeah. We got one of those sort of open days where the police come to your school and, and do demonstrations and show you all the fun and exciting stuff and leave out all the rest. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was me hooked from eight years old. I wanted to join the police. Um, joined up at 19, well, applied at 18, joined at 19. Um, and yeah, had a, I'd say out of the, just short of 10 years, seven years of it, absolutely loved. And then things just took a, Bit of a turn, really. Um, absolutely exhausted, burnout, um, diagnosed yeah. clinical depression, um, needing to take time out of the job. You, um, you hear that a lot, like. To be fair, like I, I've said it for for a long time, especially when it comes to emergency services, blue light services. Mm. You guys don't really get the recognition or the downtime that you that you need, like. No, it's 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 got worse in recent years. I mean, Christ, I've been out. It's coming up to ten years since I left. But if you back in back in twenty two thousand and four, I joined. If you'd have said between two thousand and four two thousand fourteen, if you'd have said to anyone in the job, oh, "I'm depressed," or "I'm burnt out," or "I'm I'm struggling," you might as well just hand your resignation in there. And then yeah. I don't know what it's like now. To be fair, I don't. I don't think it will have changed that much. I think there's. There's been a few high-profile cases of police officers uh, and, uh, like I said, blue light services across the board um, in recent years. So I'm, I hope they've changed. But, oh, um, I, I yeah, so certainly, well. definitely. Yeah, it, it's needed it for a long, long time. Um, but yeah, certainly back then, some of the stuff. It wasn't all work-related that resulted in me being depressed. It was, you know, stuff outside of work as well. But I said the majority of it was a, as a result of the job I was doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was it was just no one to turn to, nobody to speak to, nobody to nobody give a shit really in, in the police um back then, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um is, so is, maybe a fair few fair few colleagues who were going through the same thing and you could uh, you know, don't get me wrong, there was one or two people I worked with who I could confide in, but I'd say across the board it was just you keep stuck you keep stuck, you keep your yeah, cops short. Very much a parallel with the military on that. Yeah. It? Like now it's a bit more okay for the lads to sort of pipe up and say look I'm having, I'm having a fucking shit time but I remember one of my buddies was going through a really shit time he had um an issue with um one of his family members something happened I'm not going to discuss it too much on here um, um, previous to that he was on tour doing um he was one of the first to do MERT which is the quick reaction um medical team um, out in Afghanistan, so he he saw a load of shit, and then he got home, and then there was shit going on with his family, and he was like in shit state, and then it was, oh, what's the matter with him? Mm. Like, 
Oh, fucking clearly that. <laughs> <laughs> clearly, but back then he was like, "Fucking man up and get on with it, will you?" Fucking yeah. Man. But now, yeah, yeah, times are changing. It was very much, very much the same. Um, and I think there was a degree of man up, um, but then also the fear because depending on what you did in the police. Um, and again, this this is where I can't see it changing that much. Depending on what you do, um, if you admitted you were struggling with your mental health, you might as well, like I say, just just mm-hmm. have me notice because you were consigned to a desk. You were you were put on light duties. Death, you weren't allowed to go desk. out and, and deal with the public. Yeah, um, which made matters worse. Um, you know, if you, if you worked in firearms or um, on a on, like I did for a while, if you worked in, in, a, in a unit that dealt with sort of organised crime or anything like that, there was always that extra risk of, oh, is he is he okay to go out and face the yeah, public? Yeah. Is he oh, I bet. is he a, is he a risk? Should, should should we give him? Especially as you said, this... working with organised crime stuff, were, were you, was that undercover stuff or was that um, you were you were no, not quite. We, we were, not me personally. Um, we did work with some of the covert team, so I'll just sort of give you a background. Because <laughs> when I tell people I did just less than ten years, and I tell them some of the stuff I did, they think you're talking shit. You're yeah, full of it because I did. Meeting, I did right? quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, I did quite a lot in a in a short space of time. So I I started two thousand and four. Um, everybody has to do two years probation as a uniform, Bobby. Um, so on emergency response as a uniform cop, um, in the on the streets of Leeds, um. They created a new unit in the area I worked that it was essentially just a van full of big lads who went round. They got called to all the pub fights. They get called to force entry into houses. They get called to um, basically hunt down the, the most wanted um, in the division. Um, and I, I got asked if I wanted to join it. And as a, as a result of that, I got signed off my probation early. Um, so I joined that team for, I'd say, about six months before it just became boring. It, yeah. it was just packed in the back of a wagon, driving yeah, around yeah, with six or seven other lads. Constantly just um, waiting for something to happen on a on a on a night out. Joy, yeah, uh, yeah. Dealing and with pissed by up the time it did, yeah, exactly. And then by the time it did kick off, and you got there in time to deal with it, it was already dealt with because you're in a massive in a, in a paddy wagon, and you've got people in in the fast cars getting there before you. So by the time yeah. you got there, it was all done and dusted. Um. So I requested a move back to uniform. Um, response policing right at a time when they were going through some structural changes at West Yorks uh, and got put in an office, which fucking killed me. I got I put bet. sort of um, on a non-emergency control desk. So it wasn't even exciting stuff. It was <laughs> people phoning up to say, oh, my next door neighbor's dumped grass cuttings in me bin and boring <laughs> shit. It just absolutely killed me. Um, and I think, if, I, if I'm honest, I think that's where things started to go a little bit downhill for me because I, I just became disheartened with the job. I was in there for 12 months and just hated it. Uh, I was looking at leaving, looking at retraining and put my notice in. And, um, but during that time, there was a lot went on it, um, at West York. So it was right about the time I joined with um, Sharon Beshnevsky, um, who's the, the police officer. She got shot in Bradford, yeah. uh, shot and killed very early on. I joined with her, and that was really early on in my... I was still on in my probation and on response back then, um, and it, 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 it this didn't click until a while later actually. But when she got shot, um, word went round the station, and obviously you have your collar number. I was a, a six four um, number was what I started. So it was Sharon, and it went round. Oh, it's a six four. That's been shot six four. One of the six fours have been has been shot and killed. And the fucking I just went numb. Who the fuck is it? It's, it's one of my mates. It's got to be one of my mates because that's that's my intake. Yeah. Um, and when I found out who it was, obviously I was absolutely devastated. But there was no support. There was no sort of um, there was no counselling offered to to the wider. I'm I'm sure it was offered to her direct colleagues that worked with her. Yeah, at, yeah, at her I division, that, yeah. So I don't want to be I don't want to be sort of called a liar there. But certainly for the wider area in, in my station, nothing at all. Just got you all right, Manson. Yeah, but yeah, all yeah. right, and and that was it. Brushed over I, it. I, I had on. a I had a similar sort of thing with um. So one of one of my club one he was uh my corporal when I was out in Iraq. I say my corporal. He was one of my corporals. Um, and then my final tour, I was in the command center out in Bastion, Helmand Province, 
and uh, I get the call over the radio. There's been a uh, IED contact IED um, cat one catastrophic injuries to um, pin number. They pulled out the pin number, and I was like, "Fucking hell, mm. that's, that's fucking Robbo." That is because I I've got the list of everybody on the squadron. And yeah. I go down, find the pin number. I'm like, for fuck's sake! I literally at the end of dealing with that incident. I got a tap on the shoulder, going going out five minutes. Just went out to the toilet, splashing water on my face. Went back in and they were like, you're right? And I was like, yeah. But like, in my head, I was all right. It wasn't until like I left. And, mm. and you know, I, I never really got to de-stress from that environment. Yeah. Just into having one of your mates have his legs blown off. I'd say that you get you, you get that five minutes like it's a fucking yeah. like it's yeah. a luxury. Have you condo? Have you condo moment? I, don't, I didn't even smoke, so it's not like I could go and have a quick fag. <laughs> yeah, you get your five minutes and then right, stiff up a lip. That's crack yeah, on, crack on. Um, yeah. And that was kind of the start of it. Always been a Brit that is. Stiff up a lip. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I was stuck in this office, and that's when. You know, you've got time to mull things over because you're bored shitless, you've got nothing to do. So mulling things over. Um, just got sad to get a little bit disgruntled with the job. So I went to speak to one of the senior officers, one of our superintendents, and he just said, Look, I need to get out of the office. I feel like a caged lion. I joined the police to be out on the streets and, and helping people and doing good. And I'm I'm stuck in this office dealing with little old ladies on the phone complaining about grass cuttings and wheelie bins. Get me out of here. Um, and I just got told to, you know, hang fire. Changes are happening uh, across yeah. the whole force, so just hang fire. Anyway, a couple of weeks later, I got approached by um, Detective Superintendent, who was starting up a new unit um, to to deal with organised drug and gun crime across Leeds, uh, and then the wider West Yorkshire, and asked if I'd like to to join it. Um, and that was like dream come true for for young eight year old me back back in the day. Yeah, yeah. I that guess. was that was the dream. That was the like, boy inside was fucking absolutely. celebrating. <laughs> yeah. So absolutely leapt at that opportunity. Um so yeah, like I said, it wasn't me working undercover, but we worked with the covert crime teams, yeah. we worked with the organized crime teams, um, those specialist units that did that, the sort of test purchase officers going out and doing um, the test purchase of the drugs. Um supported on um, numerous operations, but our our main goal was to disrupt the, the sale of guns and drugs across uh, across Leeds and then the wider West Yorkshire. Um, Fucking job which was, needs to be done. <laughs> absolutely, and you know what? Even in the job, your 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 eyes were open very sharp as to what what's available on the streets. I bet. So that must, you must have. Um... You must have hated during, obviously, like the COVID times and the and the writing and all that bollocks when they were saying about defund the police and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> it, that yeah. was really fucking bug because it used to bug me. I'm like, they don't need to be defunded; they need to be funded so they can get trained more. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. There's 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 people in the forces across the country who who shouldn't be in the job. And, you know, I've, I've worked I've worked I with people. The same but... with any job, I think. Exactly, and that's the thing. That's you know, the media just love to blow um, oh, smoke yeah. on the fire, pour petrol on the fire, and hype it up because it's every single line of work's got that. You know, doesn't matter where you come from. Every emergency service, the armed forces, everything has got um, a degree of let's just say not bad to work within the job. Um, but it's a massive. Yeah, sorry, it's a tiny minority. It's a, it's a massive job. minority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a massive proportion. No, it's, it's it's a tiny minority of of say police officers who who are wrongans or who shouldn't be in the job. Very, very, and they get weeded out so quickly. Yeah, yeah. But if you if you believe everything the papers say, you'd think every copper was bent, every copper yeah. was corrupt, every copper was after beating people up, and it's absolute bollocks. It's not yeah. true. Don't, don't forget every police officer is racist as well. Don't forget that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Any name you can throw, you know, I've, I've been called it. And, yeah, if you read the media, they're the worst thing. I've always said that everybody's worst enemy until they need the police. Yes. Um, yeah. No, no, nobody, fucking, nobody, nobody moans when they're uh, straight, straight to the point and helping you out, but... Yeah, that's it. I don't get me wrong, I've been pulled by traffic police before, and they go, bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's just part of being a traffic cop. Um, <laughs> but yeah, 
it's um, if you believe that if you believed everything you read in the media, you'd never you'd never go near a copper. I'm sure there's people listening to this call never fucking you'd go you'd near never a copper anything. anywhere. <laughs> you'd never do anything if you believed everything in the media. It's uh, exactly exactly in minefield is what it is. Obviously, um, so I read in your little uh, your little bio, you um, after you left the police, it was it you started a a pub, is that right? Or did I, just that I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did. What, so made, what made you think, was... I know what I want to do, I want to own a boozer? <laughs> it's, you know, it's quite common for, for coppers to, to leave the force and, and take on a pub, either in this country or somewhere like Spain. It, it's, it, I'd love to know what the stats are, but coppers leaving this, and I, tell you, I think it's just getting pissed because of the stress of the job. It I'm might honest. be, it might be. But, but when people but leave was... the military, they tend to um, start some sort of apparel company. There's <laughs> fucking thousands of fucking veteran companies that are trying to get, either that or yeah. coffee. Veterans love coffee, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> I've got um, I've got mates who are both in and ex military. Yeah, but it's either apparel companies or they, they go into private security for a bit and then they come out. Yeah, and yeah. Go into, uh, then they realise that brand. it's basically the same as being in. So they're like, oh well, what else can we do? I don't know. I'll make some t-shirts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, so what made me do that? So yeah, I spent um, best part of the rest of my career. So I'd say. Five years, four or five years dealing with that, that organised crime uh, team, working on there. Um, that's where things really took a, a downward spiral for me because of just stuff I went through uh, inside and outside the work I was really, really going through a lot of shit, um, which you know I don't, I don't mind diving deeper into um, and, and talking about, but just to sit, <laughs> just Feel just free. to pay that Feel free if it if it helps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it could it could yeah, help so... it could help someone else. You never know. Well, this is it. Um, so I started, um, when I started on that team, I said, thought, that's it. That's my career made up. This is what I wanted to do for since I want, since I joined the police. This is all the Gucci stuff, the yeah, working yeah. with the, the sneaky beaky teams and doing all the fun and exciting stuff, running into houses, seizing guns, drugs and, and money. Um, very quickly, Three main you realize, food groups, think, isn't it? Money, drugs and, <laughs> money, yeah, drugs and it's, guns. It's, Staple diet. Um, <laughs> I think you very quickly realise when you're working in that game that it's completely futile, it's completely pointless. You, you take one dealer off the streets within 30 seconds of them being in cuffs, somebody else has taken over the yeah, line like, and the deal in drugs like cutting again. the head off the dragon, in it? Cut one Absolutely. off and another two grow. Yeah, and that's exactly it. The war on drugs fucking failed a long time ago and it's time they changed it. Um, or oh, just ended it because it's a lot of crap. And... So yeah, it, it did feel a bit like a, a futile job, but you know, it was exciting. It was good, good laugh. I was with a good bunch of lads, um, and yeah, really enjoyed the you know, enjoyed the job. But then, as my kids got older, at that point, I'd had I had two daughters. Um, as soon as the couple learned to talk, that's when problems started. <laughs> um, because <laughs> yeah, that doesn't stop either. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's when they started saying things like, "Oh, we never see you anymore, Daddy. You're always at work." And you know that that hurts. That that hits hard. So in the job we were doing, not every not every week, not every every day, but there was a lot of time because I worked in Leeds. I lived way outside my my area of of, um, of work. It was a long drive home, so there was some times when it wasn't even worth me getting in the car and driving on because I had to be back in so early the next morning. Yeah. So I used to carry a sleeping bag and a pillow in my car, um, sleep on the office floor. Um, crash on someone's sofa. I was, you know, I'm not going home sometimes because it just wasn't worth it. Um, and things just, we had financial issues at home. Um, I was going through a lot of stress as well. My, my wife at the time was struggling with postnatal depression. So a lot of um, support needed at home. Um, so two kids, my wife who was poorly, major financial issues. And I'm talking, you know, I, I don't mind discussing this at all. So I was living off my overdraft. Um, we were getting paid each month. That was topping the overdraft off uh, up, and then next day back into the overdraft. So literally living off the overdraft. And now, what a lot of people don't realise is when you're in the police, you're kind of fucked if you get into financial difficulty. Yeah, yeah. Then, then you have to declare it because it can be used. It's, le- it's, it's illegal to go bankrupt. So it's a, yeah. if, a, if a copper needs bankruptcy, I literally only know I this you... through uh, line of duty. By the way, <laughs> right? Okay. Well, yeah. So. <laughs> Line of duty is not as far fetched as some people think, but um, <laughs> so yeah. If if a copper's in debt, it's illegal for a copper to um, willingly not pay the debts back. So, yeah. in other words, avoid paying the debts. 
Um, so if you go bankrupt, that's it, time up. Um, and I was at the point where, unless I suddenly got paid big bucks, uh, double my wage one month, then I was always going to be in my overdraft no matter what. There was nothing I could have done to get out of it. So with the job I was on, yeah, working yeah, they... organised crime, yeah, if I'd have admitted say. that, if I'd have told my boss, look, I'm, I'm absolutely broke and I'm skinned, they'd have put me back in uniform because I'm a high risk of, yeah, of, being, yeah, but yeah, um, yeah. of bribery and, and stuff yeah. like that. A bit of corruption. See, Lorna Dewey, see? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so as soon, as soon as you raise your head that, look, I need help, you, you kind of, your card's marked. Mm. So I, I was sat in the office one night and really stressed, um, like I say, struggling at home, financial issues. My, my, at the time, my grand was, um, had been given like a, a week to live. She, she had dementia. So I was really going through the, all the shit you could possibly think of. Um, you know, the, the major stresses in life. I think yeah, everything yeah. was up there Fair except enough. for moving out. Um, and I, I thought, right, I need to get a grip on something. So I started looking into what help the police offered for officers with financial difficulty. And the short answer was, fuck all. Mm. There was, there's nothing. So like I say, you raise your head above the parapet and say you need Do help. Do some you, overtime, you I'm sure that would be there. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, when you get more stressed by taking up more of your own personal time. <laughs> Do some overtime. Um, and I just felt absolutely, I just felt trapped. No way out because I, I, I had two options. Keep on living the way I was or reach out for help and then either be uh, moved back into uniform or behind a desk so I'm no risk of bribery or corruption or be asked for my resignation um, because my only option was to go bankrupt or an IBA, both of which were illegal, still are. Um, so at that point, I started to think, well, I need a way out. And it had reached a point where I know I said that sometimes I wasn't driving home, but a lot of the time I couldn't afford to drive home. There was times when I was falling in sick because I couldn't afford the petrol to get to work. Um, yeah. The things were just shit, really shit. Very um, and I had a bit of a blowout at work, a bit of a fallout with one of my bosses. Um, he'd come in the office one day and he'd said to us, right, guys, I need three lads. I said, we're just getting ready to leave the office after a long day. And he said, I need three guys to stay behind. I've had some live intel. Uh, I need three lads to stay behind. It was a team of about eight or nine of us. Straight away, three hands went up. So the rest was like, oh, sound. Cheers, lads. Catch you later. And he says to me, Manson, my aunt, you staying? I said, well, actually, tonight, it's, it's my little girl's school play. I'm not seeing her for days. I want to get home and see my little girl's school play. Plus, you got your three. Right, well, that's getting fucking noted, isn't it? You're sacking the lads off so you can go and watch a school play. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I just kind of, I, well, normally I'm very good at biting my tongue, but I, I just went, you fucking what? Who the fuck are you talking to? And I, I lost it and started shouting at him. There was a slanging match back and forth in front of the lads. And he walked off and just said, oh, we'll deal with this tomorrow. And I went my way and went home. And he went back to his office. So the next day he came in and um, was sat in the office. I don't think I've ever told anyone this story, mate. So, uh, oh. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sat in the office um, and he, he straight away he says, I don't want to hear a word come out of your mouth. Very word come out of your mouth and straight back into uniform. So shut the fuck up and listen to what I've got to say. And he just started laying the law down about, don't you speak to me like that. If I tell you to do something, you, if I ask you to jump, you ask me how high. And so I was biting my tongue, biting my tongue. And in the end, I tried to speak. I, was, I thought, I need to know the shit I'm going through. This is the first opportunity I've got to open up to somebody about what I'm going through. In me. Yeah. So I thought, you know what, fuck it. He needs to know because at the minute, he thinks I'm some sort of twat. <laughs> and I'm yeah, not. I'm yeah. just going through some shit. So I went, boss, can I just speak? Shut your fucking mouth. One more time. If you speak to if you speak again, you're back in uniform. And you know when you get so angry, you just you, you can feel it boiling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I could feel it. You know, like on a cartoon where the blood rushes. <laughs> <laughs> That's like me on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was completely alien to me, but I could feel it. I could feel it going. And I tried to speak again, and he says, right, and he pulled this sheet out of his desk, said, do you want me to sign this fucking piece of paper and send you back to uniform? And I just fucking broke. I just, I was like, tears came, you know, when your eyes fill with tears, yeah. I was sobbing like a baby, but the, my te tears filled my eyes. I said, boss, I need to tell you something. You know, my nan is fucking close to, close to death. She's got dementia. This is going on at home, that's going on at home. And he listened to me, and he just went, I don't give a fuck. Oh, I don't care. You know. Sounds Get out there and do your job. Yeah. Um, it's so, one of those where, like, you know that he's a complete cunt, 
So yeah. like, I don't really want to work for you. So yeah, do you want me to sign that fucking piece of paper for you? Well, Rick. yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I did, mate. Exactly what I did. So I walked out of his office, slammed his door. I just heard it. So don't you slam my fucking door. So I went back into my office, got the paper up on the computer, typed it all up. Um, I'd like, a, like to request an immediate move back into uniform. I walked back in and put it on his desk, said, there you go, you can sign that. And he thought I was calling his bluff. Told me to go home, sleep on it, and come back the next day. So I did. Went back in the next day and said, have you signed it? Um, by that point, word had got round. So what he'd done that night when I'd gone home, he walked straight out of his office and said to the lads, ha, just had Manson crying in my office there. Yeah. Let that be a fucking lesson to the lot. Yeah, I've just had him in tears. So boasting about everything. And I knew this when I went into his office. I said, have you signed it? He went, no, are you, are you sure you want to do this? Sure you want to go back to uniform? I said, yeah, I need to get out of this office, boss, because if I don't, me and you are going to come to blows and you're going to come out worse. I said, so the best thing we can do is you sign that form and I'll go back to uniform. So he signed it. And I went and told the lads. And a week later, that was I was back back to neighbourhood policing um, at Weatherby. Um, and, and just on like, the sort of border of West Yorkshire Police. Um, and I decided by that point, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to see how this goes. I'm going to give it a little bit of time, a year or so, see how it goes. Um, and if I still feel the way I do, then I'm out. Spent a couple of a few months in learning learning the ropes of neighbourhood policing after essentially having nothing to do with yeah, yeah. <laughs> uniform neighbourhood police and arresting people for like petty crimes and stuff like that. So it was like starting all over again. But I absolutely loved it. Um, it was a little bit. I've seen the movie Hot Fuzz. Mm. It was a little bit like that, you know. The the guy who's running around chasing people with guns suddenly goes to the little yep. sleepy village, and Brilliant, the biggest thing they deal with is the swans escaped. <laughs> um, so I went back to went back to that. Um, I fucking love that movie. Yeah, it, it took some getting used to, but it, but I absolutely loved it. There was me and one other cop who, who covered like a two hundred square mile area, and Bloody kind hell. of. It was like our own little patch. The the yeah. boss was absolutely spot on. Um, yeah, absolutely loved it. But still, by that point, I'd just become so disillusioned with the job. And I still had all these issues at home, still had the financial problems, and it just wasn't going anywhere. Um, and an opportunity came up, um, or I knew an opportunity was coming up. My mum and dad ran a pub. So this is where the pub comes in. My mum and dad ran a pub. And they were talking about retiring. And I was, should I, shouldn't I? I toyed with the idea of becoming a plumber and all sorts. Um, and so I'd say in the last in the last twelve months, it was that I need to jump, but I'm scared. I need to jump, but I'm scared. I don't know what to do. I don't know. Yeah, I know the what fear. else I can do. Nineteen years old. Um, I've never sort of had a, any other job. The police was all I knew. Um, I was coming up to sort of. I, I think I was about twenty twenty six when I decided this is it. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm going to set a plan in motion. Um, and that's when, that's when the sort of, the the big problems hit. So I was at home one day, I'd, I'd just finished, we were on a, pack, a shift pattern, six on four. I'd just finished my last night shift, got home, and, and we were actually looking after the pub, me and my wife were looking after the pub for my parents who were on holiday. And I woke up one morning just feeling absolute shite. Um, really fucking fed up, really miserable. Um, and that's probably the first time I thought, this doesn't feel right. I think, you know, I'm struggling with my mental health. I've got, I've got depression. This is waking up, feeling like this, feeling like absolute dread. Nothing would make me happy. Nothing. I just couldn't gas with anybody. Um, feeling really, really withdrawn. Um, and then, kind of as you do, back to the stiff upper lip thing where you put your mask on you put your false smile on you just yeah. get on with life and, and you took it away went back to work after my rest days um, and I was I remember driving home late from, so it's all a bit disjointed around this point because it, you know, everything became a blur um, in terms of my career around this point so I just remember driving home one night I finished a late shift and there's a specific stretch of road on the way back from the police station to, to the town I lived in uh, where you go under a, a concrete underpass. Um, and I just thought, you know what? I'm just going to fucking drive into that concrete uh, wall. Um, really, I just felt fucking awful. Felt like, 
in my head, I'm thinking it'd fix all my financial problems. You know, I'd get my, my wife would get an insurance payout. She'd get yeah, my yeah. pension. She'd get all the money for the kids. Be better off without me. All those horrible thoughts that anybody who's been through suicidal thoughts will be able to relate. I'm sure. But all those thoughts of everyone will be better off if I wasn't here. Um, and it's the only way out. I could fucking horrible of. thoughts. They're mm. horrible thoughts. I've been there. I'm, I've I've had those thoughts. It's fucking horrible. It is. Um, and <clears> they, they came out of the blue. I remember driving along, and they just came out of nowhere. And it just, I was like, "Fucking, let's do it." And so I put a foot down, started getting up to, to speed. Um, so this happened on three occasions, right? So this this is a story I've told people before, and people are like, "That's fucking weird." But there's no word of no no bullshit at all here. No word of a lie. First time getting up to speed, I can see the concrete wall in front of me. I'd be little shitty Samsung Ericsson phone or whatever it was back in the day yeah, but that was yeah. on my dashboard started ringing and the picture of me my two girls came up on the screen as it started ringing it was my wife phone to see if I was on my way home and it fucking snapped me out of it like that just oh, mm. fuck. obviously didn't do anything drove home and, and said no more about it a couple of weeks later same thing happened driving home late at night I had a sh- sh- proper stinker of a shift absolutely just fucking run ragged worn out exhausted I think we'd had a, a fight and an argument at home before I'd gone to work, so I was already in a foul mood. Same feeling came, driving home. As I'm approaching the road, thinking, fuck it, let's do it. My phone rang again, um, snapped me out of it. Um, third time round, I came the closest I've ever come, so I actually mounted the, the grass verge. Um, a car spam. Um, absolutely shit my pants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Fuck, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely shit my pants. Car spun um, just before I got to the crash barrier where it would have just been like fucking pinball if I'd have hit that between the pit, crash barrier and the wall. Yeah. And I came skidded back onto the road. Thankfully, it was late night, no other cars on the road because, you know, the last thing I'd have wanted to do was uh, anybody else at the same time. So I remember stopping, facing slightly the wrong way on the road. <laughs> Flip road coming off the off one of the motorways as well. So I'm thinking, shit, I need to get this car out of the way. My heart's racing, my heart's racing like foot. Um, and it, that was the closest I ever came. And I remember a couple of days later driving back um, down that slip road, heading towards home with my missus in the car. And uh, she said to me, hey, fucking hell, what's going on there? Somebody's had a had a, uh, a close shave there, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, fucking hell, skid marks um, everywhere. <laughs> And she pointed out, and I, I didn't tell her. I didn't say, "Oh yeah, it was me the other night." Or I don't. I didn't tell anybody until probably about three, four years ago was the first time I admitted. Yeah, yeah. You know those three incidents, but it was yeah. Each time my phone ringing at the right time mm. um, was what snapped me out of it. Um, funnily enough, the third time it rang, my ringtone was. So this is a song that means everything to me, and you know, we talk about music and what what important part that played in my in my recovery in a bit but there's a song by Johnny Cash called I Won't Back Down yeah love that song um, I think it's Tom Petty originally but Johnny Cash's versions Johnny Cash is always the fucking best anyway but oh, yeah, it's Johnny it's... Cash um, there's a song called I Won't Back Down and that was my ringtone at the time so from that point on after that third third try that song's probably like stuck in my head now that's, stuck that's in your head, a special yeah. song for me Whenever if I'm you, having a shitty day now. And if those of you that but, believe in a higher power, but that, that could be case in point, you could argue. I'm not, I'm not one well, of that, it. but, you know. I'm kids not and, either. Kids, um, kids and dogs, they'll, they'll snap you out of anything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've, I've never been a, a, a sort of higher power sort of believer, but I know when I've, when I've told family that story, they're like, oh, that's your granddad looking after you. And yeah, stuff. yeah. So, you know, what, whatever it is, whatever makes people feel good, Good. Um, yeah, I'm, know, all, it's I'm all nice, for that. It's nice to think. I'm yeah, absolutely. That. My my, um, my youngest said something quite profound at, at dinner yesterday. She was, we would, I don't even know how we got into the subject, but she was like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to live forever. And I'm like, all right, how's that? And she went, well, I'm going to go to heaven, so Bless. I'll, I'll always, I'll always be around. I'm like, you're nine years old. Why are you even thinking like that? But like, <laughs> I was like, hey, wow, wow. That's fucking yeah. It's a nice, it's a nice, it's a nice, uh, nice mindset to have, though, isn't it, for kids? So uh, that mm. sort of rather than fear and death, it's like yeah, yeah. Forever, it? yeah, absolutely yeah. cracking. 
Um, but yeah, it's, it's never something I've, I've believed in or, or gone with, but whatever it was. Um, it, clearly, it clearly wasn't your time to go. You clearly had un- well, unfinished it. business. You had, you had yeah. things to resolve, things to sort out. and I like to think so. I'm a, what I am a firm believer of is everything happens for a reason. Yeah, um, I'm, that, yeah um, I'm, a, I'm a believer in that. I'm a firm believer was, in everything happens for a reason and karma as well. So if, yeah, if, you've been yeah. a cunt, if you've been a cunt in your life and... She'll catch up with you soon. Yeah, right? it'll catch up with you in <laughs> and in mysterious ways like losing your job, stuff like that. Yeah, it's um, yeah, not, it, not it's speaking soon. It's soon. Spe- speaking uh, about about someone who I'm not going to mention his name, but unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I quite often watch for if there's any news um, of of coppers being dismissed or locked over something I hope I hope that's that the boss yeah. I was on about earlier I hope, I hope he's fucking mentioned in this report <laughs> um, <laughs> definitely <laughs> but yeah from that point on he, he, even then so after those three times feeling suicidal and thinking you know, the best thing I could do is, is just go on and leave my, my insurance payout my pension everything to my wife and kids I didn't think I need to get help um, mm. I didn't think I've got a major problem you know, I just the next day, forgot about it, never told anybody, got on with my life. Um, it's as though that's like a man thing to do. I think so. I think, I think it, was a, it, was, it was a mixture of a couple I've, of things. The man it's thing like I've had a moment, society I've, expects men. Yeah, I've had, I've had a moment of weakness, but I'm not going to tell anyone that I've had a moment of weakness. Yeah, because I'm all right now. Because um, I'm fine now. Until it's, the next time. <laughs> yeah, the next, it's a, it's a new day. Brilliant. Yeah, I'll deal with. Yeah, today. I think it is. Yesterday didn't it? Didn't really happen. It's fine. I'll move on. Yeah, and then there's on top of that, there's the well, I can't tell anyone because even if I tell anyone and say I need help, then I'm going to lose my job anyway, and then I am fucked. I don't want to lose my job. I need to, you know, if I'm going to leave the place, I need to resign. I, I don't want to be fired. Yeah, yeah. So, or I don't want to be stuck behind a desk because that'll just finish me off. So, being scared of telling anybody anyway because of the job I was doing, I just felt completely trapped. And then. Like I say, my missus was struggling with her own mental health. I didn't want yeah, to go home. That, that's all going to weigh yeah. down. Like the fact that you yeah. you want to leave. It's, but you hard. it's like you want to leave, but you don't want to leave. You've got other problems, and it's all just going to keep just fucking coming down and coming down and coming down until, like, like you said, yeah, you try to drive into a wall. You just, yeah, and it's I don't know if you've ever heard of the the exercise. It's it's a common exercise they're doing like CBT and stuff like the stress bucket. Um, so stress bucket. It's talking about you've got a bucket. And mm-hmm. all these stresses are going into this bucket and filling it up, filling it up, filling it up. And unless you find a safe way of letting some of that water out, letting some of those stresses out, you know, a little bit at a time, mm-hmm. that bucket's eventually just going to fill up and, and spill over and flow. And and that's that's kind of with hindsight. Now I I know all the shit I know, and I've, I've done the training and the courses and stuff I've done in later in life. I can look back to that moment and go. I was in desperate need of some fucking outlets then because my stress bucket was flowing over. Yeah, and yeah. I was I was stupidly trying to bail the water back into the bucket. <laughs> yeah, trying to trying to put it back in. Get back, get, get back. <laughs> yeah, it was just absolute pointless. Um, so what what led me to to think you know what I need to I need to have some time out. I need to go and get some help. Was I'd taken a, a week's leave, I'd taken some some holiday from the police and. Um, again, we were back at the pub looking after the pub for my parents. Uh, me and my missus and the two kids were sat upstairs in the flat. And I, I just had one of those days where I couldn't be asking anyone I was short, you know, not, yeah. not snappy or, or moody or anything, but just. Just before you start this uh, story, Dave, we've got less than a minute on this call. So it's yeah. going to end in a second. So we'll cut, so. For, the, we'll cut for the break. It takes mm-hmm. 10 minutes for it to, to reload, and then I'll send a new, a new thing. Because. Hello! You're at the adverts, so don't turn off. Don't turn off, because I've got some good stuff for you. First up, I'm going to talk about our sponsors. Kent CBD is our first sponsor. Now, CBD oil, as you know, has tremendous benefits, especially within mental health and physical health. Personally, I use it to help with my anxiety and my depression, but not only that, I also use it to help with the aches and pains of life. In my joints, especially my ankles and my knees. Um, but yeah, without CBD oil, I would have still been on my antidepressant tablets, which I'm no longer on. So, you know, every cloud. And um, what we're going to do here at Granite Zero is we're going to give you 10% off everything from oil, muscle rub, jellies, bath salts, the lot. Yeah? 
make sure you get in there. www.kentcbd.org. Put in the promo code GRANITE0 and get yourself 10% off. You are welcome. But also, if you're like me and you love a nice cup of coffee, now, for me, I only drink one coffee, and that's Green Beret coffee. Now, I don't only drink it because it's out of this world fucking coffee, roast to order, grinded to whatever specific grind you want. But not only that, it's veteran owned and veteran run, which, you know, hits me right in the feels. So make sure you check it out, Green Beret Coffee. Get yourself a nice cup of coffee. I drink it dark, just like my soul. Incredible stuff, incredible stuff. And what I'm going to give for you, I'm going to give you 10% off. So once you get to the checkout, once you've got all your coffee, your products, your apparel, whatever you need, get to the checkout and put in the promo code GZPODCAST10 and get yourself 10% off, courtesy of the Granite Zero Podcast. You are welcome. Now, that's enough of me talking about this stuff. Back to the regular scheduled show. Check it out! And we're back after that commercial break. <laughs> but before we uh, continue with that story, some sad mm. news, mate. Tina Turner. Fucking Tina Turner. I've just seen it. Yeah, my wife's just come in and said, Tina Turner's dead. Fucking simply the best, mate. Yeah, absolute mate, legend. Not, not any longer, but, you know, sad times. My missus loves Tina Turner. One of her one of her go to karaoke songs is Proud Mary. She fucking rocks that. Yeah, song. everyone does it. Um, yeah. But yeah, fucking it's mad, isn't it? Because all these like legends that you have growing up, they're all they're all fucking dying now. I know. I was thinking I, about literally, this I, I went on my fucking Facebook memories and it came up like because I, I I literally put rest in peace, Mr. Bond. And obviously Sean Connery died like two years ago, whatever it was. I was like, fucking hell. Know. Madness. I seen that one, though. Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day, and if this happens, then it's not to do with me, but I was thinking, I was listening to Tom Jones, who came up on the radio, and I thought, fucking hell, he's getting on, isn't he? He's, he is getting on. He's, well, he's what an was absolute team, legend. Was, was the team turning 83? Was... I have no idea. That's, that's going somewhere in 83. She was, yeah, she was She was getting on. But it's not, though. Yeah, it's, uh... it's, it's, it, that's the crazy thing. Like, my missus is granddad. He's, he's got to be around 83 maybe mid-80s. Yeah. And genuinely, looking at him, you'd be like, you're not. You're you're like late, <laughs> late, late, late 60s. Because you, you mentioned your nan having, uh, having dementia and that. My, um, yeah. My, my wife's nan, she, she, really bad. Like, mm. it, it sounds horrible. But I don't know how she's still going. Like there's there's basically it's a basically a shell of what she used to be when I when I first met them um, yeah. fifteen years ago. Fucking hell, that was a long time ago. But yeah, and the, that's the only reason why my missus' granddad is aged at all is because he's mm. basically the full time carer of her nan, and yeah, her nan is now at that stage that she can only recognise his voice. Like she, does, she doesn't, doesn't even talk anymore. She sort of mumbles, mm. and and to be fair, the only thing that sort of keeps her sane is 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 music. It's put amazing the, you put the right music on. Yeah, but that it's a double edged sword though with music. I find because I found it with um. Uh, I hope he doesn't mind, but my brother, he put certain music on, and my brother's he's he's fucking fine. Put. A bit of music on that, if he, especially if he's had a, a drink or two, that reminds him of. Well, to be fair, I think it was, it was the anniversary of his death, and another one that, unfortunately, took his own life. But if you put a certain song on or a certain um, band on, mm-hmm. it reminds him of that. He, he goes on a fucking complete, complete downer. So, like, it's a powerful if, thing. It's a really if, powerful. If we're, thing. If, we're in, if we're in his little pub that he has in his house. And Lincoln Park comes on, you know. Oh God, he's yeah. going to need, need a man hug in a minute. That um, in the end, that song. No, it's um, well, basically any Lincoln Park song. I think I think that was like their go-to. But the one that really sort of kicks home is um, one more light. Right. Yeah. It, it, oh, it. 
to be fair, even even now when because I I, lo- I lost a friend to, to to suicide as well, and when you listen to the lyrics, you're like, oh fucking hell. Mm. But then you go back through a lot of the Linkin Park songs and you listen to the lyrics, you're like, there's a lot going yeah, on. There with is. You, mate. <laughs> yeah, there is. There's um, leave out all the rest is another one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a lot. There's a very deep songs. Music's a powerful thing, man. It's um, it, like I, said, I, I mentioned in, in my um, when we were chatting beforehand, but it was uh, music got me through through my mm. my depression massively, and it, it's still it's my therapy today. I pick up my guitar every single night and, and play it just as a bit of a, a blow off steam with my guitar. I go out gigging, I'm, I'm in a band. And yeah, you know what? Pretty much every week. It's quite, it's it. quite, fu- it's quite funny. So I, I, I love music. I love all, all genres. I'm weirdly, I'm quite into country music at the minute because I like the mm. way they tell stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, as, as Chris Stapleton is my favorite, but I think that's because yeah, he's because he's just fucking, he's just the man. But when it comes down to playing an instrument or singing or anything like that, it's like, oh, I'm fucking useless. I remember my brother. My brother is very artistic with it. He can play the guitar very well, um, and so can his um, my niece, his daughter. Um, but I remember him trying to teach me how to play the guitar, and he looked at me once and he went, "I don't know how your fingers are not working." <laughs> <laughs> he went. I'm telling you where to put the fi- your fingers to play the chord. Why are they not working? I'm like, I don't know. It's... But I don't. I don't know if that goes down to. I, genuinely, I don't know this. I don't know if it's down to me being dyslexic or anything like that. But when it comes down to using these fucking sausages that I have, useless. <laughs> Get me to play a sport unless it's got a racket. I'll do it. But yeah, playing the guitar. I, I mate. I'm so jealous of people that play the guitar. Or play any. Instrument. I mean, I'm, I'm. I'm I even tried the drums. Strummer. Can even can't even play the drums I'm, properly. But they're difficult. See, aren't people they? people think yeah people think the drums are drums you, are easy. They're not. You've got I always real find it funny. Rhythm. Yeah, you're right. People go, well, this is fucking. You're, they're the drummer. I'm like, yeah, but their left leg is doing one thing, their right leg is doing yeah. the other thing, and their arms are doing something completely different. There's yeah. a reason why they pull those stupid faces. It's a fucking talent is drumming. It's. Um... <laughs> Guitar, guitar, as long as you can keep the rhythm with one hand, which most men can, let's face it. And then <laughs> the other yeah, hand, yeah. you've got to know where to put your fingers. It's it's not exactly hard to play the guitar. It's just it's perseverance and toughening the ends of your fingers up because they get yeah. fucking sore. But drums is drums is is. Uh, I love watching drummers because yeah, their, their arms are doing different like fucking octopuses. It's the hands crazy, are doing one thing while the feet are doing the other, and yeah, it's it's yeah, drums are. It's not as easy. People just think they they hit a, a bucket with sticks. Yeah. <laughs> well, spe- speaking of, speaking of drummers, so my brother's fortieth. Um, a couple of it was about a month back now. Um, I managed to get him a signed, definitely maybe album from Bonehead, cool. which was pretty cool. Like I would, I would have loved to have one of the Gallagher's sign it, but <laughs> it is what it is. But the. So I found this website and it's from the bloke who wrote the letter in basically for definitely maybe All right. a lot of people think it's um, Noel's handwriting, but it's not. It's a completely different bloke, but this right. bloke has set up a, a website and he basically sells his main thing. He sells is the writing definitely maybe, and he, he will handwrite it himself. Mm. So it's a brand new original piece. Um, but other than that, he's got like original press, um, proper vinyl of all the Smart. Oasis stuff, and, and me and my brother are massive Oasis fans, and he's got all these, all of them. But I was like, I really want the Definitely Maybe one because I know that was one of his favorite albums. And I got it, and I looked, I was going through all the different things, and there was so many different, like whether it is an original press, whether it's a copy, or whatever. Blah, blah, blah. Mm. And then I found this one and it was like, and signed by Bonehead. And I was like, well, I'm fucking having that one. It's his 40th <laughs> birthday. I've got to get him something special. And little brother always pulls out the stops when it comes to a special birthday. <laughs> nice. Nice. Those are the rules. But anyway, before we um hit the, hit the uh, pause button and had the break, you, uh, you were going through a bit of a story that was um <laughs> to the end of the, yeah. the, the uh, journey in the in the police force obviously. beginning of the end of my my police career yeah so it's a 
with hindsight, it's a funny story. Um, at the time, it obviously wasn't. But so, like I said before, going through um, those those three sort of incidences where I just thought I want to end it all um, didn't make me think I need to go to the doctors and get help. But this incident did. <laughs> so I woke up, woke up in a foul mood, um, just feeling really down, really withdrawn, really just pissed off, depressed. I suppose I keep looking for a word to use. I was fucking depressed. That's that's what I was. Um, and I could just feel every everything that happened that day was just really niggling me. You know, like I say, my, I'm not an angry man. Never been an angry man, but I could feel myself losing my temper over the stupidest, littlest yeah. things. And that's when I knew. That's a that's a right massive thing. sign. The the temper. Yeah. Like, short temper, not I've, aggressive I've, and violent or anything. I've, just, I've always had a short temper, like from, well, from being a kid. But mm. when I was going through my my issues and my dramas, I, I noticed that it was becoming a lot shorter. Yeah. So normally it would take me a little bit, and then I'd explode. I'd walk off, and I'd come back, and I'd be a, I'd be all right. But then it was, like I've said it before on here before, and it's in in, in my book. It could be down to like. When my youngest was, oh, wow, would have been a, a toddler, like mm. dropping a spoon on the floor, and then that was it, and I was gone. Yeah. And I'm shouting at a fucking two year old. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's it's still, silliest little things, isn't it? It's, and like I said, it, when you notice it, if you're, like you said, if you've not naturally got a sh- short temper and stuff, and then you're still noticing it. it it's a shock, but for me, I, I was just wasn't. I wasn't. A, I was quite well known for being laid back, and you know, in the police, I've had people screaming at me, spitting at me, and stuff. I've just never, never lost my temper. But at this moment in my life, I was the slightest little thing was just making me fucking snap, um, and and just not in an aggressive outburst or violent or anything. I'd just shout and then fuck off and then just leave me alone. Don't speak to me for a good half hour or more because I'm fucking I'm up here like the cartoon thing again. Yeah, yeah, steam yeah. coming out the ears. So this particular day, um, I'd opened the fridge and there was a tub of Utley Budley and when I opened the fridge, the tub of Utley Budley fell out and I just felt the fucking anger go boom. <laughs> and I looked down and it hadn't just fallen out, it had fallen upside down. So the anger went a little bit more. When I picked it up, I noticed the lid had fallen off as it fallen and the fucking tub of the actual butter was tucked in the, the kitchen Shouldn't floor. Laugh. But I know so where you're going the with tub this. Up, the tub came off in my hand and just left this fucking tub, this mound of butter on the, on the floor. And that was it. Oh, Full on uh, steam coming out of the ears, kicking the butter, throwing the tub and then call, call the tub of butterly butterly a daft cum. Um, <laughs> <laughs> across the kitchen. And that's that's when I knew there's something not right here. I need, I need to get some help. Um, as, I, as I look up and just see staring faces at me going, what the fuck's going on here? Um, yeah. And it was my last day off work. I was due, due back at work the next day and I, I sort of took myself off through my little pity party and, and calmed down and <clears throat> I thought, you know what? I need to go get some help. So I walked back into the living room and apologised to the wife and kids for what the, <laughs> this beast throwing butter around. Yeah. And I says, I'm not going to work tomorrow. I'm fun and sick. I'm going to go see the doctor. Um, and that was the first day. The, the following day was day one of just short of six months out of the job. Um, on on sick, went to the doctors the next day. Um, didn't think about you know people say going to the doctors and getting help was is was one of the toughest things they ever did. Didn't cross my mind until sat in the waiting room, um, and then started feeling really nervous. Stood up twice to walk out. And then put no, just sit down, sit down. You're not going to get better if you don't sit down. Yeah, you need yeah. to see this through. Walked in the room, stiff upper lip, sat down, and the doctor looked at me, and he, he just felt like cocked his head. You know when people, you know when people are being genuinely sympathetic and, and empathetic towards you, and, and yeah. he just looked at me and he went, "Are you okay?" And fucking hell, it was like he flicked a button because I yeah. just broke. I was just, I, I was exactly sobbing. The, my my one was um, I had to, I had to make a. I had to make a phone, I had to make the appointment via the phone. And uh, I phoned the the doctor's practice and they put me through to whoever, a doctor, so-and-so. And she literally went, so so what's the matter? And I went, oh, there's something not right with me. And then she went, can you talk about it? And as soon as she said, can you talk about it? I was literally, I was sat in the, in the, in my work vehicle at the time. And I literally just fucking in tears. 
She went, mm-hmm. I think you need to come in and see me. And then similar thing, I went, was in the waiting room and I was like, I don't, I don't need to be here. I'm having a good day. Mm-hmm. I'm having a good day. Don't need to be here. But it was as soon as I got called through, Mr. Thompson, do you want to come through? Sat down and she went, what, so what's the problem? And I went, fucking like a, like, yeah. like open the floodgates. She was like, whoa, mm-hmm. okay. Um, you're going to, but the one thing that really annoyed to, really annoyed me and it still annoyed me to this day was the sort of depression test, anxiety yeah. test that they give you. It's on a piece of paper. <laughs> how, how do you feel on a regular day? It's like, yeah, this is this, See, is, this I, is stupid. He handed me. <laughs> I could so lie so I, on all these. Exactly, I could lie yeah. on all those and, I, I and come out with antidepressants if I wanted. Yeah. I did lie on it stupidly because it would have got me the help I probably needed a lot quicker. So when when I eventually got, I think I got the words "I think I'm." I was just like, "I think I'm depressed." I got the words "I think I'm," and then this lump here, oh, the big lump. Of tears. Yeah, yeah. So I had my little cry and then I said, look, I think I'm, I'm depressed. Um, and he asked me why. So I told him things that I told him about the utterly butley. Yeah, yeah. I told him other things that had gone on, told him the problems I was having in life. And out comes the fucking survey. Can you fill this in for me? Uh, and I did line it. I, so I got to the question about, have you had suicidal thoughts? Have you yeah. attempted suicide? And I said, no, because still in the back of my mind is, I will lose my job if I admit this. Yeah. Um, the, the, you know, I was I was trapped until I knew what what I could do if I left the police. I was trapped, so I was like, I can't admit that. I need to say no. So take no. And he sent me away. He said, okay, I don't, I don't really want to give you medication um, because you know, I think you need to think about it. He says, but I think you you need to go away and have a think about yeah, like what you'd like from me. I like that because um, I said, my, I my doctor was like, <laughs> my doctor was like, we're going to put you on some antidepressants. Yeah. I was like, oh, cool. I, I need those, like thinking. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I can't be. And as soon as I started taking them, mate, I I was, I wasn't myself, and I didn't like it. Mm. I was very numb. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I've said it countless times on here before. I'm not knocking anyone that takes antidepressants. I'm not knocking anyone that relies on them to get them through the day because it does work. For me, it didn't because mm. I was literally a numb shell of myself and. Yeah, like I couldn't cry when I wanted to. I couldn't get angry. Yeah, well, didn't really feel happy. I was just stuck in sort of a limbo of a previous person that I was. Like yeah. I'm, I'm a type of guy that needs. Not that I need the anger, because like I said, I'm short tempered. But that is part of my makeup of who I am. Like if my missus asked me to build something, I'll attempt to build it. At some point, I'll get annoyed and throw something, but then eventually I'll get... But with this, it was like, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I even Go read the sense. instructions. It's not me. <laughs> that's not, that's not me. Yeah, stop it's it. not me. But that's what I was trying to get at. It didn't feel like me, and I didn't want to be reliant on little white tablets to get them through the day. But well, this is like when I went people, there. People, I, I people need them. People need them, so I'm not they're, saying they're that don't take them. And obviously, I'm going to put a disclaimer on this. If you are going to come off your antidepressants like I did, don't do it exactly as I did it, because that will make you even worse. So I went cold yeah. turkey, and that's when I went full, complete dickhead. And yeah. I went from being the highest of the highs to the lowest of the lows, and that's when, yeah, the, the thoughts crept back in. Yeah, it's, it's it. weird how it impacts. So I'd seen people close to me, um, my wife, my mum, my and another relatives and friends who, who took tablets and it helped them. So I went in there thinking, I want tablets. I need something to take the edge off so I can sort my head out. And he sent me away. So I walked out the doctor's fucking fuming. Thinking, well, what's the point? Well, no, I'm, I'm not yeah. going to get the help. I, I've got no reason to be off school. Off school. I've got no reason to be off work <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I need a letter from my, from my teacher. Um, I've, I've no reason to be off work tomorrow. Um, I'm like, what the fuck? So I got halfway home and thought, nah. Not having this. So I turned back around, walked back into the doctors, and he just looked at me and went, I thought he'd be back. So it was it was like he was testing me. Anyway, we, we had a chat and he prescribed me tablets and I went away. Uh, I was the same for for a good two or three weeks. It fucked me up. I had, yeah, my jaw was rattling, um, felt numb, but I just thought just, you know, I know the side effects are let's just persevere with it and go with it. There were there were a lot of side um, effects. Like Yeah, there is. There there was there, oh. My missus would hate me for saying it, but there was even times in the in the bedroom, like 
Oh yeah. The, the the good old captain was just going. You you could be rock hard, mate, but nothing's going to come out of it. You're going to be yeah. You're going to be lost. You're gonna you're gonna make her feel like there's something wrong with her. <laughs> yeah. And then you're going to say it's not it's Absolutely. not you. It's not you. Yeah. If it was you. He wouldn't be working at all. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it fucked me up for about two or three weeks, but then it started to wear off. Um, but I did exactly what you just said there. But <clears throat> so whilst I was taking them, I decided this this whole sort of mindset kicked in. I went home that day with my tablets. I said to my wife, look, I want to, I'm going to beat this. I'm going to kick depression. So I've been diagnosed with clinical depression and burnout. Um, I've been signed off work. Give me a two, two or three month. I can't remember now. Two or three months sick note at the time. Sign yeah, off yeah. work, and I said, "I'm, I'm, I'm going to be this. I'm going to kick depression in the bollocks." Um, and it's it's a phrase I, I still refer to now. Kick it's depression a good, in the bollocks. It's a good mentality to have to start with. Yeah, that's that's. I wanted to come at it like I was fighting an enemy, if you like. Mm. So I said, "Right, first thing I need to do is learn what's going on inside my body, what's going on inside my head." Um, exactly and I bought a book. Thing. Um, a book called uh, Depressive Illness, Curse of the Strong it's by a guy, uh, by a doctor called um, Tim Cantatha it's ca- it's really really thin but he puts it really simple he, t- he explains exactly what's going on with the chemical balance in your brain your limbic system and what happens with depression that's, and it, it's fucking brilliant I read it and I was like, I felt like I knew what was going on inside me then and then I was like well, if this is what's broken, if this is what's not working properly inside my body all I need yeah. to do is figure out a way to fix it step by step. So I set about this this whole sort of routine of right. I'm, I'm going to address that. I'm going to fix that. My diet, my my fitness. My I didn't want to. I felt like shit. And the last thing I want to do is go and exercise and stop eating shit and stop drinking. But I thought this is what I need to do. It took me a while to actually put it into practice. Over the over time, um, I got to a point where I thought I'm a little bit better now. Um, so just shot of six months it took when I said I'm, I'm going to go back to work. I'm going to, going to go back to the police. Um, went back, you know, sort of long story short this bit, but went back. Um, everybody treated me like some sort of fucking leper. Mm. Um, my, my boss at the time, he dragged me in and says, how are you doing? I says, I'm not bad boss, but I thought I'd have heard from you at some point over the last six months. You know, nobody's phone told to check up on me. Nobody's nobody's checked in to see how I am. Yeah, I had to go to occupational health and get permission to go back to work. I says, and I've come back and been told I'm on light duty, so I can't go out the nick for another, for another three months. And he said, yeah, well, I was going to call you, but I just don't get all this depression nonsense. It just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand it. So uh, I just thought it's best if I didn't bother calling you. But the, and that the, was the mindset. The annoying thing about that is, I don't get all this depression nonsense. <laughs> yeah. Hey. The exact words. Hey, I don't need you to talk about depression. I just could have done with someone to phone me up to say, exactly. You're right. Fancy yeah. a beer? How are you getting on? You yeah. doing all right? Yeah, I'm doing all right. That could have been a fucking boost that you could have needed for that fucking. Yeah. It's all it would have taken, just, you know, to feel like, oh, what? To, to work feel that you're still wanted and not, like, yeah. as you said, a leper. Like, yeah, I'm not fucking um, mental. I've got... <laughs> I'd probably, yeah, I'd probably one or two friends who, like, when I went back, they were at sound as folk, just tre- you know, carried on like nothing had happened, carried on like like they did when I was back at work, and it was the banter and the good laugh. And then yeah. they had a couple of people like, oh, careful, oh, he's crazy, and, and you know, make trying to make jokes. Yeah, that yeah. Were typical, I suppose it was the same in the forces, typical sort of, yeah, well, I had it ill timed jokes, but sort um, of, sort of well meaning. When I was at, well, I sort of made the joke. So um, it was uh, bonfire night, and my then boss said, uh, "Oh, by the way, Tomo, you've got to um, go down to the school and work the um, fireworks display." I went, are you, t- "Are you taking the piss?" And he was like, "What?" I went, "What was if I have an episode? The fucking, it's like rocket attack." Yeah, <laughs> and he was like. Oh man, I didn't even I didn't even realise. I went well. It's lucky that I'm taking the piss out of you, isn't it? I'll see you. <laughs> and I went down there and did it. But then he went right. I'm going to put this back onto the client. So the client then uh, <laughs> came over uh, like a couple of days later with the big team meeting. She was like, I said to my my then boss, she was like, how did uh, how did the fireworks play? And he was like, yeah, it was all good until um, Tomo had an episode and was shaking on the floor and. <laughs> Thought he was in back in Afghanistan getting bombed. 
she was like, oh, no way. R- really? Is he, is he okay? Uh, does he need anything to come? I was like, oh, fucking this has gone too far. <laughs> yes, I do need to. And I need a new bottle of whiskey. <laughs> and I need some fucking cake. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, to, don't write to those that are listening. Don't treat people with depression like they're fucking absolutely completely mental. They might actually appreciate a phone call to say, how you doing? Like pe- people are just awkward, aren't they? It's still the same today. I mean, society has come on so much further now. I mean, I'm talking, so when this was going on, you're talking 2012. So 11 years ago. Good year, it's, it's completely different now. Um, good hmm? year for Brit- British sport. Good year. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it, it's changed now. I mean, People are still a little bit. Open. People don't know yeah, how to they approach are. the subject. They don't know it's, how to have that conversation. It's it's um, getting there. That's where we're it is getting there. The the whole stigma behind it is is starting to yeah. fade. I but... think the awareness is building, isn't it? But it's um, this I think there's still needs to be worked on around of course, how the awareness have the conversation. is building that they get a whole week. Yeah, yeah, a whole Fuck week off. Of the year. <laughs> your fucking mental health awareness week. That's all you hear then on on the radio. Oh. Mental health. And this is this is one thing I, I I spoke about on my um I did a a lone as I call it a lone wolf podcast mm. on the last one I did, and it's a lot of the way they talk about mental health and mental health awareness is as depressing as depression. Don't make it so depress depressing to talk about it because that makes it fucking even worse. It's like oh my. I, I I was a stickler for it when I I I made a sort of a mini documentary um, when I first started the podcast and it was very much sad music in the background. Oh, I, I was mm. and looking back on it now, it, I was getting to the point of what was wrong with me, but also that that wasn't the be all and end all. It wasn't like it doesn't need to be so dark and and you know, well, dark and depressing. Yeah. I am a firm believer of, you know, you've got to take, you've got to, at some point, there's a, there's a quote, I can't remember who said it, but and I'm, not, I'm going to misquote it, so I'm not even going to attempt, but it's basically saying, stop throwing yourself a pity party. You can mm. you can have a, you know, you can have your, your pity party, um, but just cut it short. Don't fucking dwell on it. Go and, go and have your, your piss in your moan and you cry about it, but ultimately you need to take positive action. You need to step up. You need to... Yeah. You know, you can have all the awareness you need, but it's it's action that gets the results. It's action exactly. that takes that makes the difference. Um, and there does need to be more more focus around that. But I think there needs to be more done about educating people how to have the conversation with yes. how to how that, to approach somebody who's got depression. You're spot on there. the The main thing is, like you said, the education around it and what could cause people to have it. What and everybody's different. And and so on and so forth. And I think how... it needs to start at start at schools. You know, it's it's yeah. It's well, schools. I, I, I've said it. Be, I've it. said it before on here. My my daughter's primary school were very good at it. Even they 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 do the awareness days. They do the odd socks days and fucking all that. Yeah. They even went down to my daughter came home one one evening. My eldest and she went, Dad, you know, um, Winnie the Pooh is all about mental health. And I went, what? She went, yeah, each character in Winnie the Pooh is a different... I don't know if he wrote it like that on purpose, but each character has their own mental health. Winnie the Pooh is obviously an overeater. He's obese. Eats eats for comfort. Then you've got Piglet. He's got anxiety. Uh, Eeyore. He's depressed. Tigger's got ADHD. Rabbit's got OCD, and she was reeling them off, and I was like, okay. "I've heard wow. it before about ER. I didn't realize what the other." I was like, "Wow, you, I, you've hit the nail on the head there, Jesus!" <laughs> and it was even down to like the the kangaroo, the mum. She's overprotective of a a kid, yeah, a uh, roo, as it were. I was like, "I never, I didn't even think of that." No, and I've heard it before about um, about Eeyore, but you know, because yeah. he is fucking, he's not getting around yeah. it. So he's depressed as well. But no yeah, the others, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, when you think about it, you're like, oh yeah, yeah. Tigger definitely has ADHD. Definitely. 
<laughs> but yeah, it's um, yeah, there, there definitely needs to be more done around how how to approach, certainly around suicide, how to have the concept. There's still that myth going around and that that belief that if you ask somebody how you feel is suicidal, it increases the risk of them being suicidal. And it's absolute bollocks. You know, it's, it's proven. It's, in fact, if you if you do any sort of mental health first aid training or anything, it's, a, it's the one thing they tell you. You know, asking somebody if they're having suicidal thoughts or if they feel suicidal or if they've got plans to commit suicide. Well, you don't say commit suicide now, you, you, but it's, um, you know, asking somebody if, they're, if, they're plan, if they've got a plan for suicide doesn't increase the chance of them um, doing something and harming so, themselves. It's, yeah, so, it's sometimes you, like, like we said, sometimes it, you need to have that conversation. You know. You just need to be blunt about it because if you beat around the bush and try and fluff it, that's when people retreat. That's when people don't want to speak. Ah, I'm all right, it's fine. You've just got to be blunt about it. Yeah. You know, I've had to do it inside and outside of work several times now. Um, it's well, the first couple of times you do it and you ask the question, it's good, you're going to feel awkward as fuck. But to the people yeah. listening, if you ever if you ever suspect anybody's feeling depressed, down, or you're worried about somebody and they're feeling suicidal, just ask them. Yeah. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm all right. Are you sure? Because I'm worried about you. And then if it comes to the point where you genuinely think they might be thinking they're harming themselves, just ask the fucking question. Yeah, definitely. Does this sort of coincide with the sort of stuff that you're you're doing now with the with the social media stuff that you've got? Yeah. So. So we are we're, we're skipping a big chunk, but there's a reason behind my madness on this. <laughs> yeah, so so I I decided that part of my therapy, part of my getting over depression was blogging. So I used to blog anonymously a lot when I was in the still in the police. When I left the police, I started blogging in my own person. So I got rid of that veil of anonymity. Um, and I've had loads of different blogs over the years, and different names, different titles, and stuff. But now this this so what I'm doing now with men in men in mind is I don't just want to write about depression and mental health. I want to write more about mindset. Um, Sort of, I'm I'm beginning to at the minute I'm studying to be a coach, leadership management coach and stuff. So I want to I want to approach different subjects, not just mental health. So men in mind is it's just my blog. It's written with men in mind. Um, so it's all about increasing your mindset, increasing your well-being, and talking about mental health and, and encouraging those conversations. Um, and then I'm also working on a book, um, which is called How I Kick Depression in the Bollocks. Writing that in the background. Love all that. Um. I'm going to be releasing that. I've got this plan. I've said it years ago when I first started writing it. It's been a long, a long process. Um, keep stopping and starting it. But I said once when it's done, I'm just going to release it. It's going to be on there for free. People can download it or whatever. So I'm a firm believer. If you've been through it, if you have figured a way out of it, if you've got your depression yeah, yeah. under control and and you've you've got that map or that blueprint that could help somebody else, there's kind of that. I feel there's that moral obligation to help other people. Yeah, so, and I agree. It's like um. I had a discussion with a with a a guy that I've had on the show before. He he was sectioned and all sorts, and we both were in the same in the same mind mindset of fuck your qualifications. Yeah. Who else is better to talk to you about something relating that than someone who's been through it? Yeah, like I I went through a, a stage of going for I went through uh, online coaching. Um, depression awareness i i did a, a an inner armor coach course and, and and things like that and yes it was all tools to the uh to the bat belt to guide myself and help others if i if 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 needed but you know my 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 way of 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 dealing with stuff was 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 talking and that, that's the best way to mm. deal with it in my yes. opinion that's my opinion yeah writing it down talking, the minute you start talking uh, you know, the minute, or yeah, writing it down, blogging, like I say, help me. Even if you don't publish it, even if you just write in a journal or something, just writing, getting the shit out of your head on the paper can help massively. I still journal today. Um, but blogging, talking, journaling, whatever you do, just get it out of your fucking head and it, it makes a massive difference. But I think what, what people need to be careful of, there's, there's a quote I love and it's, uh, be sure to fit your own oxygen mask before attempting to help other people. You know, you hear it from yeah, yeah. stresses every time you go on the plane. Yeah. I was, it's, uh... There's people out there at the minute who are still really struggling with their mental health and they're, they're like, oh, guys, I can help you. if you, you know, yeah. my, my DMs are always open if you need them. Just focus on you. I, I was that guy. Sorted. I was that guy. Um, and like I said, I, I really went on a downhill and I stopped my antidepressants. 
And I was I was the huge fucking mental health advocate. Don't fucking do this. Don't do that. Do this. Do this. Do this. Did I do it myself? Did I fuck? Yeah. But that's the one but, thing. That's what I was going to touch on earlier. That's the one thing I did that you did as well. I, I came off my tablets cold turkey. Yeah, yeah. Against all the advice from the doctor, I, but I, because of all the work I've done, the research I've done, the I felt I, I was strong enough to do it. I thought, yeah, you know same. what, I don't need these, and I think I can do it. I think I can ditch them. And I, I went against all the advice. And again, as you said, disclaimer, if anyone's listening and thinking of doing it, don't fucking don't do it, because it's, the risks it. are huge. I turned out all right. Thankfully, touch wood, and everything was fine. Yeah. It didn't have any nasty effects for me. But I know so many people who did. Yeah, same here. Don't do it. It's not worth the fucking risk. Same here. Yeah, don't, don't fucking do it, guys. Please. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it's it's fucking. We we could we could we could spend all fucking night talking about this sort of stuff. I think I think um, and we we've only scratched the sort of the surface with 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 mm. your story and 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 whatnot as well. Um, but I'm actually really really fucking excited to potentially get you back on again. Um, I'm just yeah, love to man. Fucking yeah, absolutely. Um, and I haven't had any fucking dinner yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and when you when you're training, and and you'll probably be a, a a huge I hate this word advocate for this, as well. You know, a lot of people say fitness, fitness, fitness. Oh, it will make you better. Yeah, it fucking does. And it doesn't just make you better on the outside. Um, personally, myself, I've lost three stone now since January, um, which nice I'm quite, which I'm fucking happy about. I needed yeah, to because I've got a fucking football match coming up in July, so I needed to. <laughs> yeah, I did talk about that. I listened to the last I, podcast. I, 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 go out, I go out now and I go out daily and I do the, the sport that I love, which is football. Football mm. is my is my passion, is my love. I always has been since I was fucking three years old. But just going out there every day, like there was there was times where my weight had plateaued and I was like, oh, fucking hell, what mm. am I doing? I'm still a, fuck it, I'm still a fat fucker. And in my in my own head, because I know where I was when I when I did my boxing match, I was at peak fitness, I would yeah. say. Um, but you know, I'm I'm still carrying a lot of lockdown weight, which is it is what it is. I I gained a lot of weight. I'm not gonna fucking lie to you. I, I bloomed right up. You and me both. But but losing that three stone, and when I stepped on the scales the other day, because I'm not one for stepping on scales. I'm more like. In, in terms of myself, I'm more for inches. If I've lo- I'm have i losing inches, my yeah, travel yeah, don't fit in, I know something's working. Because I also, from a physical instructor background, I know that fucking muscle weighs more. So I know that I'm gaining yeah, the muscle. Absolutely. But anyway, yeah. So, it, and from doing that, my fucking mental health has gone fucking skyrocket. Like, I'm now yeah. at a, a stage where I'm helping, like, even my missus is still struggling a little bit. Um, imposter syndrome she's got at the moment. Mm. Set up a, uh, her own salon and whatnot. But I'm, I'm, it's I'm at common. that stage it's, where it's I can now help problem. her. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm helping her yeah. because I'm okay in my own skin. Yeah, getting active, doing it. I mean, I've, I lost, I was diagnosed diabetic in January, so I needed to lose weight quickly. Um, you know, in November last year, I was 23 stone. Uh, January, I lost a little bit, but I was I was still twenty one and a half stone in January. So I, I set myself a goal: seventeen stone by uh, by July. Yeah. Um, cur- currently, stepping on the scales on Saturday, I'm seventeen ten. So I've lost just shot of four stone um, yeah, since January, and four and a half or four four stone five pound. It will be by the time July comes around to determine to hit that target. But you just feel like a different person. Oh, definitely. It's not, it's not so much losing weight. It's, you know, some people will be out there feeling like shit and don't need to lose weight. It's just the, it's getting active, walking. It doesn't have to be going to the gym. It doesn't have to be going running marathons. Yeah. Just get out and walk. Get outside. Bridge, brother. Lift some weights. Press up, sit ups, whatever. Do it in your house. Just the minute you start moving, the better you'll feel. Absolutely. Definitely. Definitely. I've just noticed we've got, that can have been 40 minutes, but we've got less than a, <laughs> less than a minute. Where can where can people find you? Uh, men, men in Mind blog, Men in Mind blog on Instagram. Or I'll tag hey you in lad it. on Instagram. Um, but yeah, definitely. Um, I'll tag you in it. And Dave, we're definitely going to do a part two because we've got other bits. Of yeah, this, absolutely. Especially um, love to homelessness yeah. and 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 things like that because I really want to get into that. 
but I'm sort of worried yeah. about the time. But generally, mate, fantastic chat, and thank you very much for your time for coming on. Oh, thanks for having me. And just yeah, just let me know when you want me back, man. I'll, I'll, oh, I'll I'm, I'm getting back. you back. I'm getting you back. But yeah, cheers, cheers, Dave. Cheers, yeah, mate. All the best. You cheers, too. Mate. Take care, mate. Bye bye.